Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, the uh, verdict in the criminal conspiracy case regarding the demolition of the Babri Masjid was pronounced. This was by a special CBI court in Lucknow. And all 32 persons who were accused of this conspiracy have been acquitted. Now, this includes, of course, prominent BJP leaders like LK Adwani, Murli Manohar Joshi, and Uma Bharti. And the charge was that there was a criminal conspiracy that the demolition of the Babri Masjid on December 6, 1992 was pre-planned. And now the court has said that it was not pre-planned. So we have with us senior journalist Rajan Mukhopadhyay to talk about this, who has worked extensively both on this issue and this as a whole. Thank you so much for joining us. And first of all, I just wanted to quickly get your initial response to the verdict. Were you surprised by this verdict? It has taken a long time to come. We'll talk about that later, but were you surprised by the verdict? Surprised? No. Saddened? Definitely. Uh, not surprised because over the last several months we have seen how the judiciary on several occasions has become more mindful of what we can call at one level is a sense of societal thinking and at the other level that what is thinking in government quarters or in the official corridors of power. So uh, we have seen very uh, you know close proximity between the judiciary and the other arm of uh, the uh, the government, the, the legislature, as well as the executive. So, not really surprising, but saddening because this judgment is not just a simple case, but it's something which pertained to a matter on which in 2010, let me remind you, two very important uh, Supreme Court judges, Justice Bosch and Justice Nariman, uh, said that the demolition of the Babri Masjid was a huge attack on the secular foundations of India. Even the Supreme Court in its November 2019 said that the de demolition of the mosque was an egregious violation of the law and that it was a, clearly a criminal case. Uh, so one expected that uh, CBI special judge was looking after this criminal case, that he would at least provide a semblance of justice. So while sticking to law, there has been absolutely no justice delivered. Right, absolutely. And uh, could you also quickly take us through uh, the chronology of the case also, because this case has seen a lot of ups and downs. The Supreme Court has intervened on multiple occasions. And it's been uh, so many years. It's been close to 30 years now. And we have seen no justice, uh, the ju justice being, or the verdict being just delivered right now. So how has the case progressed over all these years? Because as opposed to a civil case, which was uh, far more contentious in terms of the history, in terms of the multiple claims, this was basically a question of uh, assigning, say, criminal conspiracy, if there was one, and assigning, uh, clearly uh, delineating what happened in the run-up to the demolition. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you look, at, uh, look back at the 27 years since uh, the time that really work began on this case from 93 onwards, you know, the, the, the basic mistake which was made by the Narsimha Rao government was that two very hasty FIRs were lodged on that day. One was uh, FIR number 197 and the other one was 198. Uh, one was against unidentified car savers, unnamed car savers, and the other was against specific leaders. Uh, confusion was created right in the beginning. Thereafter, I think that the government was not very serious about trying to prove criminal charges. It was essentially using it as a political ploy to subdue the BJP. That was the strategy of Narsimha Rao and the Congress government at that particular time. So this case uh, continuously, right from 93 onwards, kept moving from one city to another. It first, after the FIRs being registered in uh, Fezza, it went to Lalitpur. From Lalitpur, it went to Rai Bareli. From Rai Bareli, it came to Lucknow. Then it went back to Rai Bareli. Till finally, the Supreme Court said, nothing going up, bunch together. All of these cases and listen, listen to each one uh, in Lucknow. That is when it started, daily hearing started in 2017. In between 93 and uh, 2005, there were several twists and turns, including it came that when uh, all the uh, so-called political VIPs were recruited, or 
the uh, charge of conspiracy, they were, you know, it was removed from the case. Then again, after the Supreme Court's intervention, they were the, you know, the trial court was told to institute charges of uh, conspiracy against him. That is how it was started. Uh, right from the beginning, if you actually try to uh, look at this particular case, uh, give a very tight, close scrutiny to it, which has not been given much, primarily because the entire focus was on the civil suit, the title uh, suit, which is called. Uh, here, I think you know, successive governments neglected the entire case, and I would not exclude anyone, including the National Front government, which was there in power. From uh, uh, 96 onwards till 98, uh, 97, 98, till the Gujal government uh, fell. Even the UK government after 2004, 10 years, they were in power, but they really did not to expedite and actually get justice done. And in this context, of course, there's a, also a general question that comes out like after November's judgment, after the recent incidents around uh, recent the ceremonies around the temple, and now this verdict. What do these really say about the kind of India we are living in right now, when there was definitely uh, institutions have agreed, the uh, highest institutions have agreed that this was a crime, that this should not have happened, and now we have a series of events over the past one year. So how, what do you really think this says about the kind of country we are living in? So I think we are definitely a much more majoritarian, loving country, you know, loving the majoritarians in India and what we were when this agitation started in 1984-85. From that time on, if I keep telling people that, suppose we plot an imaginary index of Hisoko, and on the, uh, you know, the axis at the bottom, we put the number of years, you know, right from 1980s till 2020. And in the uh, vertical axis, we plot the value. So we will find a constant rise rising from 1984 onwards and it keeps on rising. It does not stop even between 2004 and 14. So I think the biggest failure of a government which was avowedly secular was that it was not able to regard, forget pulling it, pushing it back, uh, the communal sentiment in the, in, in the country and uh, greater and a popular support for Hindutva ideology. So I think we have become a much more a Hindu to a loving country. Actually, we have started believing what Supreme Court had stated that uh, Hindutva is a way of life, a highly contentious statement to have made, a very sweeping statement, totally confusing between Hindu, Hinduism, and Hindutva. They are not the three completely different things. Anyway, that is something which. But now, the moment you say Hindu, it means Hinduism. And that is the right. And do you see that this case might actually progress in terms of appeals? Is there a scope for, say, maybe even the verdict being reconsidered or challenged in the higher judiciary? No, earlier today, I had uh, you know, seen the Congress statement, and at least thankfully for once, they have said that they really expect that the government, both the center as well as the state, to file an appeal against this judgment and go to a higher judiciary. I hope that. Does, but I do not expect it. I think that they are going to say that it's been a long time. The country has expended a lot of uh, time and energy and resources on this. So it's best to put closure to this uh, entire issue. The Supreme Court has, in any case, settled, and the Ram Temple is coming up at a very quick pace. It is now time for us to forget the, to forget the past and uh, move ahead. So let us not linger on with this case because the CBI judge has given a patient hearing and looked at every pro and con of this particular case. So uh, I really don't expect uh, any appeal being filed. Absolutely. But uh, uh, nonetheless, it also the fact remains that there is that way no closure because Ayodhya was only one plank of the larger movement. There was also uh, Kashi and Mathura as well. And in recent days, we've heard, uh, say once again, many of these ideas coming up, uh, they begin to spread in popular culture. They were maybe buried for a long time. Uh, and now they're again sort of coming up in the media. They're coming up in discussions. There was even, I believe, a, a petition to sort of re-examine the issue. 
So how do you see the impact of this verdict and also the verdicts of the past year on these kind of, say, movements which are being led by the right wing? Prashant, the beauty of right wing forces right from the time that they became very assertive from the mid-90s, 1980 onward, is that uh, they keep on repeating the same actions all the time. And one tends to forget what has happened in the past. We are immediately looking at Mathura and Kashi in the context of a case that has been filed in Mathura about three or four days ago. Whereas, let me remind you that immediately after November 2019, at that point, one BJP MP, uh, I think he's a member of Rajya Sabha, if I remember correctly, a gentleman called uh, Harnat Singh. He had gone in a virtual fancy dress to Parliament House during the winter session and said that after uh, Ayodhya, now it is the turn of Mathura and Kashi. I have written, and written articles for News Click in which I have said that how between November and till the time, you know, in May and June, uh, from the time a series of events happened, there was a meeting in Mathura in, in Varanasi in February in which a committee was constituted where Subramanian Swami was named as the president. Uh, there was, after uh, the lockdown was imposed for a few weeks, there was silence on Mathura and Varanasi front. But sometime in, uh, towards June or June, it was in July, that uh, there was a new committee was set up in uh, Mathura, Krishna Janam Bhumi Mukti very much mirroring what had happened in, in Ayodhya, the Sri Ram Janmabhumi Mukti Yagya Samiti. So it's the same story, just the way that the RSS and its front organizations were initially not involved in Ayodhya. Here too, the RSS is not involved in either Mathura or Varanasi at this moment. But take it from me, it is just a matter of time that this is going to be first formally an agenda of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. It cannot allow the leadership to pass on to another organization because along with leadership comes a huge amount of resources which is generated by way of donations and offerings which come their way. They are not going to allow this to be captured by someone else. And after the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, the RSS is going to start passing resolutions at its various uh, meetings saying that the aspirations of the Hindu society could be fulfilled and at the final end, just the way the BJP did in June 1989 with the Palampur resolution, the BJP too is going to pass a resolution saying that given the tremendous will of the people for uh, you know, the restoration of the Krishan Janam Bhumi, the Kashi Vishwanath Mandir, we are extending support and we feel that the demands should be pursued and ask the government, whichever is there in power at that time, if it happens to be their own party government, then it is going to be quicker. If not, then we can expect another round or several more rounds of agitation. Already in between, Yogi Adityanath, the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, has continued with this extensive Hindutva campaign, the latest being the renaming of the MOOC proposed Mughal Museum at Agra into a Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum. Even though in history there is very little uh, link of Shivaji with the city of Agra, whose history begins with the Lodis who went and uh, you know, made Agra their capital. Absolutely. So what we're definitely seeing is an intensification of this campaign, which also in some senses sends a message to the minorities, sends a message to tribal communities, sends a message to uh, the liberals, leftists, everyone that the push towards creating a Hindu tour country is very much going to be on. Definitely, you know, this is going to be the constant come to point whenever there is a crisis, whenever there are issues, whenever the government or the BJP faces challenges on other areas, this is what they are going to harp back or fall back on all the time. Absolutely. At the moment that there, are, there is a crisis, in terms of the handling of COVID, both in terms of health, in terms of economy. We have a very uncertain situation with China on the border front. 
The best way to contain all this is by generating a false sense of euphoria over Ayodhya, which has already happened. Now it's going to be the turn of Mathura and Varanasi. Thank you so much, Nilanjan, for talking to us. Thanks. Nice meeting you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.